Another one from Grimm's Fairy Tale, The Throstle Beard, page 47. So, a king had a daughter who was beautiful, beyond description, but so haughty and disagreeable that no suitor was good enough for her. She not only rejected one lover after another, but poked fun at them. Once the king gave a great feast and invited all the marriageable bachelors to come to it from far and near. They were all uh, ranged in a line according to their ranks. First came the kings, then the princes, dukes, counts, barons, and last of all, the pages. The king's daughter moved down the line, but to everyone she had some objection to make. This one was too fat, the barrel, she ejaculated scornfully, that one too tall and this daddy long legs was her comment on him. Another was too short, short and stout and awkward, she said. The fourth was uh, too pale and a death's head. A fifth too red, a turkey's cock. The sixth was not upright enough like a piece of bent wood behind the stove and so on. But the one she made specially merry over was a king with a crooked chin. Good gracious, she exclaimed laughing, the fellow has a chin like a throstle's beak. And from that day the king was given the name of throstle beard. The old king, when he saw that his daughter did nothing but make game of people and that uh, she despised all her suitors, grew very angry and uh, swore that she should marry the first beggar who came to his gates. A few days later, a wandering musician began to sing for arms under the window. The king heard him and ordered the man to be brought in. The musician came in his dirty, ragged clothes, sang before the king and his daughter and then asked for some small reward. The king said, Your song has pleased me so much that I'll give you my daughter's hand in marriage. The princess shuddered, but the king went on. I made a vow that I would give her to the first beggar man who came this way and I will hold to my vow. It was no good to resist. The clergyman was sent for and the princess was uh, united to the wandering musician. After the marriage, the king said, now you are a beggar's wife, it is no longer uh, seemly for you to stay in the castle. You and your husband must go at once. The beggar led her out by the hand and she was obliged to accompany him on foot. They came to a great wood and the princess asked, To whom belongs this wood, I wonder? The musician replied, It belongs to the good king Throstlebeard. Had thou, hadst thou taken him, it would be thine. And she answered, I, a poor maiden, gently read, as would I have taken, ah, would I had taken King Throstlebeard. Then they came to a meadow, and she asked again, To whom belongs this pretty green meadow? It belongs to the good old king Throstlebeard. Hadst thou taken him, it would be thine. And again she sighed. 
I, a poor maiden, gently read. Ah, would I have, ah, would I have taken King Throstlebeard. Then they came in a big town. And again she asked, to whom belongs this beautiful town? It belongs to good King Throstlebeard. Hadst thou taken him, it would be thine. To which she replied, I, a poor maiden, gently read, how I wish I had taken King Throstlebeard. I'm displeased, said the musician, at your wishing so continually for another husband. Am I not enough? At last they reached a very small house and she exclaimed, The smallest house I did ever see. Whose prey may this hovel be? The, may, the musician answered, It's my house and yours, where we are going to live together. She was obliged to stoop so as not to bump her forehead as she went in at the low little door. Where are the servants? asked the princess. What servants? Asked the, um, answered the beggar. You'll have to do everything for yourself. Look sharp now. Light the fire. Put the water on the board and then cook my supper. I'm Precious tired. But the princess knew nothing about making fires and cooking meals, and the beggarman was obliged to lend a helping hand, or nothing would have been made, and nothing would have been done. After their frugal supper, they went to bed, but early the next morning he made her turn out to do the housework. For a few days they lived in this fashion consuming all their provisions and then the man said look here wife this can't go on we are eating a lot and earning nothing uh, you shall plate baskets make plat we have to make a plat of uh, weave out baskets that is he went out cut some um, osiers and brought them home the wife began to plat, but the rough ones tore and scratched her delicate hands. I see, he said, that won't do. You shall spin instead. Perhaps you will be able to spin better than you can plat. She sat down and attempted to spin, but the hard threads cut her soft fingers and blood poured from them. You see, he said, how it is? You're no good for any work, and I have made a bad bargain in marrying you. Now I must try and start a trade in uh, pots and pans and earthenware articles. You must sit in the market and sell them. Oh dear, thought she, suppose anyone from my father's kingdom would come to the market and see me selling pots and pans. How they would jeer at me. But there was no help for it. The only alternative was to die of hunger. So the first time she did well for people bought things from the woman because she was pretty and willingly paid the price she asked. Indeed, several gave her the money and made her a present of the pots. Um, the two lived on her earnings as long as they lasted. And then the man bought another lot of earthenware and crockery. She sat in a corner of the marketplace, arranged her wares and offered them for sale. Then suddenly a drunken soldier whose horse was running away rode into her stall and smashed all the pots and pans. She began to cry and was in despair as to what she should do. Oh dear, what will be, what will become of me? She moaned. What will my husband say? And she ran home and told him of her misfortune. 
Tears are not fitting in the eyes of a vendor of earthenware, said her husband. You are not suited to any proper work. I have been, therefore, to the palace of our king and asked if you could not be employed there as kitchen maid. They have promised to give you a trial and you will get your board for nothing. So the princess became a kitchen maid. She had, in, she had to drudge for the cook and do the dirtiest work. She kept in a pocket under her dress a jar with a stopper in which she took some savings and scraps and on these she lived. It happened that the king's eldest son was to give a, to give a ball in honor of his coming of age. On the great night, the poor young woman went upstairs to look on from behind the doors of the uh, saloon. And as she saw the lights lit one after the other and all the beautiful people in beautiful dresses being announced, she almost wept at the dazzling splendor of everything and thought with sorrow of her own wretched fate. Repenting bitterly, but her haughty and discourteous behavior Bitterly, her hot, haughty and discourteous behavior, which had plunged her into such poverty. From the costly dishes which were carried to and fro, the delicious smell of which made her mouth water, the, wa uh, the waiters now and then threw her a few scraps, and these she put in her jar with the intention of taking them home. When the king's eldest son walked into the saloon, arrayed in velvet and silk with jewels and a gold chain round his neck, he saw the poor woman peeping from behind the door and took hold of her hand and asked her to dance with her, him. But she refused, trembling, for she recognized King Frostlebeard, the suitor, who had wooed her and when she had uh, held up to ridicule and scorn. But in spite of her struggles, he insisted on drawing her into the hall and when uh, the string that secured the pocket under her dress gave way, the jar rolled out and the soup and the scraps fell all over the floor. The people laughed and she became the object of general amusement. She wished herself a thousand miles under the earth. She felt so ashamed. She rushed to the door longing to escape. But on the staircase, a man stopped her and brought her back. And when she looked at him, he too had the face of King Throstlebeard. In a kind and friendly voice, he told to her, Don't be afraid, I and the fiddler with whom you lived in that wretched hovel are, the, are one and the same person. I disguised myself for love of you, and I too was the drunken soldier who rode into your stall and knocked over your spots. These things have happened to break your haughty spirit and to punish you for your pride. She wept and sobbed bitterly. I was very wrong, she said, and I am not worthy to be your wife. He, however, comforted her. The past is over, he said. Now we will celebrate our wedding feast in good earnest. At this Ladies in waiting came and arrived, arrayed her in splendid clothes, and her father and a whole court came and wished her joy on her marriage with King Charles Beard.